Hi, everyone, and welcome to The Reality Check, the Canadian show that explores a wide range of controversies and curiosities using science and critical thinking. I am your host, Darren McKee. Today is a bit of a special episode. On April 19th, at age 82, philosopher Daniel Dennett passed away. In our modern age, we no longer believe in giants, but it feels like one has just fallen. This brief show is a tribute to Dennett. I can't possibly capture the totality of his thinking, his impact, and how much his ideas have influenced me. So I'll do a bit of a point form rundown of some of his key ideas, explaining them as I can. While I will primarily share the brilliance of his ideas, I also want to highlight his kindness. Dan would sometimes play rough with his fellow intellectuals, but in most of his writing, his interviews, and meeting him in person, he was so kind. Of all those Four Horsemen books, Dan's was the only one I would recommend to religious people because it wasn't overtly insulting. He always seemed to be kind and thoughtful and considerate. Okay, a quick rundown of some of his books. Elbow Room, which is this book about free will, which I highly recommend. I think it's a great book still, all these years later. And it's one of Dan's favorite of his own. What you would get from this is an exploration of determinism, really interesting ways thinking about it, and why, you know, of course, if determinism is true, it's always been true. The book's not going to make it true one way or another, as well as separating determinism from fatalism. People often confuse these two things. Fatalism is no matter what you do, a certain outcome will occur, while determinism means something that would be caused to happen, and you are part of that causal chain. If you don't actually do the thing, it does not happen. The subtitle is Varieties of Free Will Worth Wanting because Dennett really tries to make the case for what he considers a determined free will, a compatibilist approach, if you will. Now, some people don't like this approach, and actually I kind of disagree with it, but if I can draw an analogy, one could say love doesn't exist. It's just chemicals and molecules. While other people would say, well, can't we just say that's what love is? And that's a bit what Dennett is doing here. One could say that free will doesn't exist, like love, or you can say it does exist, it's just not quite what you thought it was. And that's actually a recurring theme throughout his work. Another book of his, The Intentional Stance, was a collection of essays, a bit more philosophical, so I wouldn't necessarily recommend it to everyone, but it was broadly about treating systems as if they have goals, and also this is the level at which explanations make sense to us. Example I think listeners have heard me use before is say there's a man who's talking to a woman and the man blushes. Okay. Why did this happen? Well, you could say some particles and protons and electrons moved around, which led to this blushing. And that's true, but it's not really informative to us humans. That's at the physical stance. Well, at the design stance or the biological stance, you could say, well, some blood vessels changed in the cheek, which caused a flushing. And this was the redness, which led to blushing. Well, this is still true, but not useful. Again, it's not a useful explanation. At the intentional stance, you could say, he just realized that she knows that he likes her. Ah, this is why he blushed. This is useful. Is one of these explanations better than the others? Not quite, but to a human, the third one is what's going to actually be meaningful and useful. Similarly, the notion of as-if goals, you don't have to worry about whether something really has goals or truly has goals. If it acts as if it has goals, it can be treated as an intentional system. If any of you happen to read my book and I was talking about AI systems, I was trying to highlight that you can treat systems as if they're acting in a certain way. You don't need to worry about whether a system is conscious or has goals in the way humans do. Is an AI system trying to win at chess? Is it trying to achieve certain things? Trying in quotes? Sure, why not? It just makes it easier to talk about. Now, Dennett was very concerned about AI risk, but less so about the larger risks that I've talked about in my book, because he thinks that won't happen anytime soon. His primary concern was counterfeit people. This relates to deep fakes, but other uh, AI entities that could simulate people and how this could lead to the erosion of trust, which would be a threat to civilization. Won't get much more into that here. One of his biggest books, Consciousness Explained, uh, was excellent. It came out in 1991, I believe. Acknowledging that providing a brief summary of a 400-page book will be inherently flawed, 
I thought it's useful to at least attempt a bit of an eight point description of the content of the book, making the main arguments and then some of the logic supporting those arguments following that in, well, brackets, but those might not <laughs> yet hear brackets well in audio, right? So number one, a theory of consciousness must be materialistic. And the brackets, dualism brings more questions than answers. How does something non-physical affect something physical and vice versa? Number two, a materialistic theory of consciousness is possible. It might actually be inherently flawed, but if we don't try, we won't get anywhere. This is a methodological assumption. Three, as a first person, subjective account has limited information and is easily biased. The approach must be to use third person objective analysis while including first person reports as data. We all make mistakes and we don't know everything about the universe nor about ourselves. Therefore, we should use more objective measures. This is a methodological approach. People think they have special access to their mind, and in some ways they do, but in other ways they know a lot less than someone looking from the outside, especially if that person has training and equipment. Number four, the feeling of a central you is an illusion. Basically, if you open up the brain, there is nobody home. There is no central processing unit, nor one place where all activity converges. Therefore, number five, you, or consciousness, is distributed in space and time. If there is no center, then it is spread out over the brain, and therefore it is the activation of different brain parts at different places and times that give rise to your consciousness. It has to be that way. Number six, if there is no center, there is no finish line or boundary to consciousness. If consciousness is the result of multiple brain parts or processes working together, then it makes little sense to ask, when were you conscious? Seven, it is mainly our linguistic abilities that lead to the creation of consciousness with ideas and words creating structures that further respond to ideas and words. But full language may not be a necessary condition. There are likely levels of consciousness. Also, although it may seem so, we probably do not frequently think in words. Eight, only a theory that explained conscious events in terms of unconscious events could explain consciousness at all. If your model of how pain is a product of brain activity still has a box in it labeled pain, you haven't yet begun to explain what pain is. Your notion of what you are, think, and feel may not be quite what you thought it was. Now, that's a lot of dense points, uh, especially if someone's new to this space. I, it's not comprehensive, right? People say, well, what's his model of memory? And does this model really work? And it's not perfect. It's a metaphorical conceptual explanation is how I see it. And some of those key points though, that you have to be distributed in space and time, and that especially an explanation has to leave out consciousness. It has to, has to explain the thing. People often want an explanation in terms of their feelings and it won't make sense. It just won't. All of these points have some startling implications for the things we seem to think we are and care about most. As for what you are, then it would say that the self is the center of narrative gravity, as real as the physicist's concept of a center of gravity. Here is the admittedly likely unsatisfying statement in Dennett's own words, speaking as the author in the book. This is from page 410. There is still one puzzle, however. How do I get to know about all this? How come I can tell you about what's going on in my head? The answer to the puzzle is simple, because that is what I am. Because a knower and reporter of such things, in such terms, is what is me. My existence is explained by the fact that there are these capacities in this body. Again, I can understand how that may not be satisfying, but if you're interested, you can check out the book. It is uh, tricky to read though, I'll be, I'll be honest, if one has less background in philosophy and science. What else has Dennett done? Well, yes, Darwin's Dangerous Idea, a book about evolution, I think is one of the best books on evolution. He did a great book called Breaking the Spell on religion as a natural phenomenon. He co-authored a book about jokes. All of these are so well done. It really is impressive, right? One of the best books on evolution, Dennett. One of the best books on free will, Dennett. One of the best books on consciousness, Dennett. Many other domains, also Dennett. Uh, I thought I'd do quick contrasting here between Dennett, I think at his most accessible in an eight minute TED talk from years ago, called Cute, Sexy, Sweet, Funny. Yes, Google it or search on YouTube, TED Talk, Dan Dennett, Cute, Sexy, Sweet, Funny. Briefly, he's talking about one of his favorite things, the strange inversion of reasoning that occurs with evolutionary thinking. 
And he talks about cute, sexy, sweet, funny, and mainly leading with why are babies cute? It's tempting to think babies are cute because, well, they are. Look how cute they are. But you have to explain it in a bit more detail about why that would be the case. And through evolutionary thinking, we can come to see that we see babies as cute because whatever human babies would look like, that's what we would see as cute as a having a survival advantage. This is why things that look like human babies are cute. So in a way, it's not that we see babies as cute so much as that cuteness is what babies are. Check out the talk. It's only eight minutes. So as this little mini tribute comes to a close, I'll end with a longer quote from Dennett that is less accessible. I'll read it out and then I'll share what he's trying to say by focusing on some of the phrases. This is from his 1998 book, Brain Children, in chapter 25, The Self-Portrait. There are some ellipses here. The first stable conclusion I reached was that the only thing brains could do was to approximate the responsivity to meanings that we presuppose in our everyday mentalistic discourse. When mechanical push comes to shove, a brain was always going to do what it was caused to do by current, local, mechanical circumstances, whatever it ought to do, whatever a God's eye view might reveal about the actual meaning of its current states. But over the long haul, brains could be designed by evolutionary processes to do the right thing from the point of view of meaning with high reliability. Brains are syntactic engines that can mimic the competence of semantic engines. The appreciation of meanings their discrimination and delectation is central to our vision of consciousness. But this conviction that I, on the inside, deal directly with meanings turns out to be something rather like a benign user illusion. So trying to unpack some of that, first stable conclusion I reached, that's easy, was that the only thing brains could do was to approximate the responsivity to meanings that we presuppose in our everyday discourse. So they can't respond directly to meanings. It doesn't work that way. When mechanical push comes to shove, the brain was always going to do what it was caused to do by current local circumstances. Push-pull causation, neurons fire, cells do what they do, molecules move around. That's why a brain does what it does. It does not operate on the level of meaning at root. But over time, through evolutionary processes, from the point of view of meaning, which again is a bit of an abstract idea, you can see how brains start to respond to these things. Brains are syntactic engines, and here he's using a parallel syntax, sort of the rules and the ordering of words uh, in language. So just think of it as something that puts things in the right order, can mimic the competence of semantic engines, something that's meaning-based. So something that can just sort things in different orderings can mimic the competence of something that responds to meanings. And here he says the appreciation, their discrimination is central to our view of consciousness. So while it's not directly the case that humans respond to meanings, we can approximate something that does. And that's all we can because we're physical things. And in a way, if you keep pushing on anything you consider meaningful, it's sort of molecules at root, particles, whatever you want to call it, quantum foam. So how do you get there? Well, you have to understand that it's only approximation, but an approximation that's pretty good. So the idea that you, on the inside, which again doesn't really make sense as a central thing, deal directly with meanings has to be some sort of a user illusion. And the often analogy, often used analogy here is a, the computer interface one might use, right? When they're clicking something on their phone or on their laptop, putting stuff in a folder. That's not what's going on underneath. That's not what a computer does, but it sure looks like it and it approximates what's happening with enough fidelity and reliability that it becomes functionally useful and viable. As I said, that wasn't really Dennett at his most accessible. Some of his more recent books are more so, Bacteria to Bach and Back, or even the Thinking Tools one. But if you're willing to sort of roll up your sleeves and put some time in, it's probably good to get some of the other books. And you probably have to read them because some of those footnotes are detailed and relevant and interesting. And uh, I can end with a quote, which isn't directly from Dan, but is in relation to his work. Of course we have a soul. It's just made of many tiny robots. Thank you, Daniel Dennett.